Our text today is from the epistle in the closing chapter. The God of all grace, who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a little while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. If you have ever written a letter or received a letter, you know that after the main thing has been said, you toss in at the close all kinds of personal remarks. Grandma broke her leg. The dog got run over by a car. Your old girlfriend was married last Saturday. In a similar way, and on a higher plane, the apostle here does the same thing at the close of his letter. He, he says, for example, I am writing this with the help of Sylvanus, my faithful brother. Sylvanus is the Latinized form of Silas, a name that pops up in the New Testament again and again. Silas was a traveling companion of St. Paul. Silas could never have written a letter like this, but he was the Silas was the man who could deliver the mail. And isn't it odd, after all the centuries and the notable personalities, the name of Silas is still remembered, not because he was brilliant, successful, wealthy, but because he was the best thing a man can ever be, faithful, the one thing and the only thing ever God ever asked you to be. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Mark sends his greetings. Mark was that frail fellow human being who failed so badly and his first chance to serve the church. He ditched out on his brothers at the very time when they needed him most. But when Mark got the second chance, he made the most out of it. And he left us the New Testament gospel that bears his name. Greet one another with the kiss of love. It seems a little extreme, by our reserved Western customs. But you will find that notice at the end of four other letters. He is not speaking of a romantic interest here. Early on in my marriage, I was impressed. Coming home from distant conferences, late night meetings, my wife always greeted me at the door with a kiss until I suspected that she was merely administering a breathalyzer test <laughs> to see if I was hanging with the rowdies in the congregation. But I have noticed that in times of personal crisis and stress, at tearful farewells and warm homecomings, hugs and kisses are still very, very much in place. Letter or no letter, apostle or no apostle, persecution or no persecution, Peter is saying, you still have each other to love and be loved. Don't you ever put that down or take it for granted. Then a footnote appears that has fascinated Bible scholars for centuries and spawned all kinds of weird guesses. The church that is in Babylon sends you her greeting. Babylon was the name of one of the world's oldest cities and certainly the most famous city of antiquity, situated as it was on the banks of the Euphrates River, not far from where Saddam Hussein has his headquarters today, Babylon was the capital of the greatest empire this world has ever seen or ever will 
filthy by God's own estimation. But Babylon was also a scourge in the hand of God upon his people Israel. The Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem, enslaved the survivors, and led them away captive far, far from their homeland. And ever after, the name Babylon became a synonym for worldly pomp and power and hostility to God's people. And so you will find it in the writings of the prophets right on through the book of Revelation. Now the theory is that Peter is trying to conceal his current address from the authorities. That he is writing this in a coded language that only Christians would understand. That Peter is living in the current Babylon of the day with its anti-Christian power. The city of Rome, where Emperor Nero has begun to fan the flames of persecution. Here I am says Peter, smack, dab in the middle of the modern Babylon, and yet I am not alone. The church is with me. There is no place on the face of the earth too inhospitable and no circumstance too unfavorable for souls that are fed by the Holy Spirit. And it shouldn't surprise you to find that in the closing lines he returns to a theme that is run like a silver thread through the fabric of the entire epistle. After that, you have suffered a little while. Peter speaks of suffering as fact, not as optional, not as occasional, but as inescapable, and inevitable. He's not speaking about sufferings that are part of the human condition, the tears, troubles, trials that all people are subject to. Peter is speaking about the sufferings that come to you because you are a Christian. And they come in many forms and from many different directions. For 2,000 years, countless sermons, books, Lectures have been produced on the subject of suffering, especially unjust suffering. But no answer ever given, practical, theological, philosophical, has ever spoken to burdened hearts and tortured minds as the figure of the crucified Christ. In that one image, we see a God who suffers with us with a love that endures the pain rather than ever let us go. And in the company of others at the foot of the cross, we realize that suffering can have meaning and that there is hope for life beyond the suffering through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. After that, you have suffered a little while. True. Time does seem to stand still when you are suffering. And true, no words of comfort can ever take the suffering out of suffering. But he is very specific to tell you it lasts a little while. It does not last forever. Suffering has an end. And you've got to keep reminding yourself of that again and again, or you will despair and do all kinds of shameful things to escape the suffering. Suffering is part of the story, but it's not the end of the story. The suffering is temporal, and you can put up with anything, like going to the dentist, as long as you know it won't last forever. The glory is eternal. And have you ever noticed these guys make no attempt at all to describe the glory for you in detail? In another place, St. Paul says that you can't use earthly language to describe 
heavenly realities because there are no words. Now we see through a glass darkly, he said, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then shall we know even as also we are known. St. Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That means that if you write down on one page of a ledger book all the things you have ever suffered, and then on the other page begin to write down the glories that you shall share, you'd slam the book shut throw the pencil down as a waste of time because there is no comparison. The God of all grace, that's how we make it. You can't hardly talk to an earthbound creature like myself about glory because there's nothing glorious in my life. And even my faith at its best, is up and then down again affair. Is it possible that a guy like me could make it to glory? Yes, it is, the apostle says, because the God of all grace will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. The word perfect has changed its meaning over the centuries. The literal word is artisan, you know, an artisan is somebody who can fix something that's broken, repair something that's deficient, uh, put the shattered pieces carefully back in place. God is the artisan who restores us, establishes us so that we aren't wavering all over the place, strengthens us, supplying what we need in our weakness and infirmity, and settles us on solid ground, on a firm foundation, like that house of which Christ spoke, built on a rock so it could withstand the wind and the rain and the floods. Now, don't play that down. That God establishes, strengthens, and settles you. Why don't you look around once and see the people who are not Established, strengthened, or settled. People who are frightened, anxious, paranoid, alienated, having nothing to tie to, nothing to anchor to, drifting aimlessly through life, their days without purpose or meaning, making their miserable situation worse by taking another wrong step after another. Did you know that in our affluent society, that most, that the nervous psychiatric disorders count for most of the hospitalization and longer stays of recovery than almost all of the other diseases combined? Unstable, unsteady, unhinged. And have you never noticed that other people in the most trying circumstances hold it together even though you wonder why their hearts don't break in pieces and why their minds don't go kaflui. I remember a tragic farm accident. Two boys on a tractor turned over in a road ditch, bursting into flames, pinning the one little boy at the bottom. It was about as heart-wrenching a scene as you can imagine. And while the men were trying to decide who and how someone was going to break the news to the boy's mother, for she was very high-strung, and eight months pregnant at the time. And here she came, down the dusty road in a pickup truck, 
to the very scene. We all wanted to shield her from. And I'll never forget what happened next. She was the pillar of strength among the men who were badly shaken. She radiated peace to the others who were so in sore need of it. She was drawing strength from an unseen source, from a hidden reservoir that nobody knew she had. It's exactly what the apostle is saying. God will establish you, strengthen you, settle you, and if God said it, he can do it, and he will. Next question, why? <laughs> why would God ever do it for folks like us? Because he is the God of all grace. The giver of all goodness. I don't care whether you believe that or not. All of the sunshine that had ever shone on your head, all of the love and laughter along the way, all of the strength and health and healing and family and friends and courage and wit. All of it was there for you simply because it was in the heart of God to give it to you. And the God of all grace does not ask you to climb the inaccessible height. Grace comes down to your level and finds you where you are. Grace does not ask you to go and meet halfway. Grace goes all of the way looking for you. Grace does not analyze your sin. Grace forgives it. Grace does not measure the lengths of your chain. It shatters them. Grace, this amazing grace, does not give you what you deserve. Gives you better than you deserve. Like the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. There's a reward, but it's all of grace. And when the rug is pulled out for the last time and you find yourself falling, grace has it that you will fall into the everlasting arm. And the last written word of this epistle is peace. That's what the hard-pressed Christians of the first century needed to hear. And that's what all of us still need to hear. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.